the dispersion relation. This historically seems to be a very confusing topic for students, so I'm going to do my best to make this as simple as possible because it sheds a lot of insight on the properties of a material and how waves behave when they propagate through those materials. So let's dive right into this. Let's derive the dispersion relation. When we talk about waves, we start off with the wave equation. And we do some math on this, and we solve it, and we get a solution in, inside of linear homogeneous isotropic materials that are plane waves. And they have this form where we have some amplitude and polarization and a plane wave phase sort of oscillating term. Now what we're going to do is take that solution for a plane wave and plug that back into our wave equation. And so that's what we've done here. We've just replaced E in the wave equation with our plane wave solution. The polarization term, this P vector, is a constant. So it can come to the outside of this Laplacian operation. And then we can divide both sides by P. So it's gone. We calculate the Laplacian, and if we think of this as just a second order derivative, what happens is this minus jk comes out twice, and when we square that, we get a minus k squared. There actually is a, a few more steps in here. You'll expand this into Cartesian coordinates, but in the end, that's what you get. We get a, a minus jk, all of that squared, which ends up just being minus k squared. Now we can divide both sides of the equation by that, that exponential term, and we are almost there. So this is the equation from the previous slide. What we'll do is we'll just remove or move this k naught n squared term over to the right-hand side. This essentially is the dispersion relation. However, let's remember that k squared, that's the magnitude of our wave vector, is the magnitude squared is kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared. Let's also remember that k is omega, the radial frequency times refractive index over the speed of light. That lets us write our dispersion relation this way. And it essentially fixes the magnitude of the wave vector as a function of direction and frequency. So the strict definition out there, you'll see that it relates the wave vector to frequency. This brings us into the topic of index ellipsoids. So there's our dispersion relation that we derive for linear homogeneous isotropic materials. Now let's stare at this for a bit. Does that seem familiar at all? Well, if we stare at it long enough, what we might realize, that is actually the equation for a sphere. It would be a sphere if your coordinates were kx, ky, kz, and the radius was k naught n. And in fact, that's how we're going to interpret it. And so we've drawn a sphere over to the right. That sphere is called a dispersion surface or a k surface, and it's very close to something that we'll call the index ellipsoid and we'll see that. But a K-surface and an index ellipsoid are essentially the same thing. They're just a constant different from each other. So given this K-surface, let's pick a point. And so we pick this point right here. The next thing we'll do is we'll come up with a vector that extends from the origin to that point. That will be our wave vector. And so in this case, this K surface maps out all of the possible magnitudes of K as a function of direction. Well, this is a sphere that tells us inside of a linear homogeneous isotropic material, no matter what direction a wave is trying to go inside that material, it always sees that same magnitude wave vector. And that makes sense. So no matter what direction a wave is trying to go in outer space, for example, it behaves the same. 
But that's not true for all materials, and there's some really cool stuff that happens when that's not the case. Now, when frequency is known, this K naught is simply omega over C naught, so that is frequency. When this is known, the magnitude of K really conveys refractive index. Because this K naught is a constant, it's known. So the magnitude of the wave vector is conveying refractive index. And this is really where your K surface becomes an index ellipsoid. If you divide it by K naught, which is just a constant, now we have a map of the refractive index that a wave experiences as a function of direction. And if it's a sphere, no matter what direction the wave goes, it sees the same refractive index inside of the material. So here is just kind of a recap of our index ellipsoid for isotropic materials. It's a sphere. Kind of boring. But what would happen inside of an anisotropic material? Remember what an anisotropic material is, depending what direction your electric field is oscillating, it experiences a different permittivity. And the same thing for the magnetic field might experience a different permeability, depending what direction it's oscillating. It turns out these aren't necessarily spheres anymore. So for uniaxial materials, that means there's two directions that the electric field can oscillate that'll see the same permittivity and the third one sees a different one. If we were to derive our dispersion relation, and it's a bit more complicated to do so, we would get the last case, and probably the most general case, is called a biaxial medium. And this is where it's anisotropic, and the electric field will see a different permittivity in all three directions. So there's sort of three different permittivities happening at the same time. Now, what will turn out, the dispersion surfaces are shaped kind of crazy, so not necessarily like this. I just drew something. But what is what does happen is that they touch at four points. So here's one point, two points, three points, four points. And it turns out we can put an optic axis through two of them and another optic axis through the other one. It's called an optic axis because since these dispersion surfaces touch, no matter what the wave polarization is, uh, it will always be the same. But in other directions, it can be quite different. And so that's a biaxial material. Let's talk about material properties and some interesting phenomenon that can be understood through these index ellipsoids. So we're looking at a cross section of an index ellipsoid. So it's a, just a two dimensional picture here. And it's a circle. So this is for an isotropic material. Now, if we pick a point on the surface and we connect the origin to that point on the surface, this is our wave vector. This is the direction that the ripples of the wave will be traveling. Phase travels in the direction of the wave vector. Now we can ask the question, what direction is power going? And power is just defined differently. So what we'll do is we will construct the tangent to that surface. That's this black dashed line here. That's the tangent. Power goes in the direction perpendicular to that tangent. And I'm writing the pointing vector here. Now, this is a sphere. So the pointing vector and the wave vector are aligned. They're parallel. So power and phase go in the same direction. And we are trained so much on this simple case that we always think that power is moving in the direction of the ripples of the wave. And that's not always the case. In fact, that's really a special case. These can be misaligned. Let's think about what happens inside of an anisotropic material that has an index ellipsoid now. It's not a sphere. And we'll pick a point on the surface. If we connect the origin to that point, that's the direction that the ripples of the wave will travel. That's the direction phase is accumulating. Well, let's follow our rules. Let's draw the tangent, and we know now that power goes in a direction perpendicular to that. Here, power and phase are misaligned, and this happens a lot, but it's much more complicated to analyze, so most of the people were trained to think this way, so when power and phase are misaligned, it seems like a magical thing, but it actually happens a lot.
Now this is hard to picture, so we got a, a picture on the next slide that shows what happens. So we have a wave going from an ordinary medium into one that's anisotropic and has that a crazy shaped index ellipsoid. In the first medium, notice here's our wave fronts and both power and phase are going in this direction. So this is happening just as we would expect. Now in the second medium, our eyes are blind to phase. So our eyes are not actually going to see these ripples here. We're just going to see a beam moving to the lower left. That's the direction that power is moving. However, the ripples, the phase, which our eyes wouldn't be able to see, is traveling in this direction. And this is something that actually happens. And the analogy I like to use to try to understand this, you know, imagine you spin in a circle real fast, 20 times, and then you come out of that and you're really dizzy. And you look at something off in the distance and you walk toward that. You're facing it. You want to walk that way. That's the direction phase would go. But you're dizzy and your body's moving off to the side. And that's the direction your body is actually moving, even though you're pointing somewhere else and you're trying to go somewhere else. And so waves inside these mediums, they're dizzy like that. So power and phase can be misaligned. This, by the way, is called negative refraction. And there's several ways that this can happen. We're not going to get into that here, but it's negative refraction in that the beam on the second medium is going in the opposite direction that it should. It really should be traveling more in, in this lower right direction, but it's going to the lower left. And so it would have a negative refractive index. Although there's ways you can get negative refraction without negative refractive index. Here's something else that's quite interesting. So here's what happens in, in two isotropic materials when we butt them together. We get refraction, and we're used to that. You, know, you put a spoon in water, and you see it bend. Or you put a stick in water, and you see it bend. But what happens when we have an ordinary medium bumped up against an anisotropic medium? Remember, these anisotropic mediums actually have two index ellipsoids at the same time. Well, it turns out, since there's two index ellipsoids, there's actually two possible directions that the light might go or the electromagnetic wave might go. And this happens. This is called double refraction. And what I'm showing here is a big chunk of optical quartz. The surfaces aren't polished real well, but you get the idea. We actually see two EM lab logos in the background. That's not a silly blurring effect. That double refraction happening because that crystal is anisotropic. There's two different refractive indices at the same time. And the last phenomenon we'll use an example is a neat one called self-collimation. Imagine for a second if your index ellipsoid had flat sides. So we'll look at the underside. And these, the span of red arrows, these are all the directions that phase may be trying to take your wave. But since the surface down here is flat, and we draw a tangent to each of those points, the power goes in a straight direction. So no matter what direction phase is trying to take the, the beam, power is going straight. And here's what a lattice might look like that does that. So what does this actually look like? This is a simulation of a real lattice. And what you see is a beam coming in at an angle. It's also a diverging beam. But if you look at what happens inside the lattice, the beam is following the lattice and the beam width is fixed. It's no longer diverging. So waves inside of a self collimating photonic crystal, they're forced to follow the lattice. And it has everything to do with how those index ellipsoids are shaped. So that's called self collimation.